Hello and welcome to our third Thursday at Hoover's. I'm so glad you could join us this evening. I'm Brad Reiners, the Communications Director at the Hoover Presidential Foundation. We'll begin the program in a few minutes, but first I have a lot of news to share with you about upcoming events that you'll want to participate in. Last week, we launched a new website called timelessvaluescampaign.org. If you visit that site after this program, of course, you'll learn about a major fundraising campaign for the renovation of the Hoover Presidential Library and Museum exhibit space. It's been about 28 years since the last renovation, and we're excited about bringing new technology and other updates into the museum. You'll also learn about a special benefit for Iowa taxpayers who contribute to the Timeless Values campaign and how to earn a 25% Iowa state tax credit for your gift of any size, no matter how much the gift is. Now let's take a look at some upcoming events. Next month on third Thursday at Hoover's, we'll have video and audio clips from President Hoover's burial here in West Branch, which occurred in late October of 1964. It should be a very interesting program and registration for it will open next week as we finalize the details. In addition to that, there are four other October events lined up for you. On Saturday, October 23rd, the Hoover Presidential Foundation and the West Branch Lions Club team up for the Hoover Hunger Project, where we hope to package 100,000 meals for distribution in the US and overseas. We need lots of volunteers to help package these meals it's gonna be held at the Hoover Elementary School Gym in West Branch. Volunteer shifts are from 10 o'clock till noon or noon until two. You can learn more about that and how you can help with this effort by searching Facebook for the West Branch Lions Club, or you can go to our website, hooverpresidentialfoundation.org under the news and events tab, then the calendar of events is where you'll find that. Also on October 23rd, we invite you to come and watch 14 amazing high school seniors from all across Iowa as they present the results of their Uncommon Student Award Civic Projects. This event runs from nine until five that day with presentations about every 20 minutes. Each of the students will earn a $1,500 award for their work and four of them will earn a $10,000 scholarship to the school of their choice. You'll be amazed at what these students have accomplished this summer. The event is located at the Radisson Conference Center in Coralville and is free to attend. Now, also that day after a, a long day of packing meals and supporting the Uncommon students, you'll want to unwind with a great dinner and program at the Brown Deer Golf Club in Coralville at 6 p.m. Richard Norton Smith, a nationally acclaimed presidential historian and biographer will be our keynote speaker. And he always brings some fascinating stories. We'll start the evening with a cash bar reception at six, followed by the meal and the program at 6.30. Tickets for this event are $65 each. Members of the foundation and their guests get a member rate of $50 each. You can lock in your tickets at our foundation website, again, in the calendar of events section of that site. Then on Sunday, October 24th, we're inviting Richard back to participate in a Hoover Forum, along with the former director of the Hoover Presidential Library, Tim Walsh, and Dwight Miller, a retired archivist from the library. Tom Schwartz, the current director of the library, will be the moderator as the panel discusses presidents learning about presidents. They'll bring stories of past presidents and first ladies who have visited the Hoover Presidential Library and the things that they've learned. This is a free event and it runs from 1 to 3 p.m. on Sunday. It takes place at the Hyatt Regency Ballroom in Coralville. And we ask that you reserve your free seats online in advance so we can set up the event more efficiently. You'll find the registration information on our website right along with all the other programs under that calendar of events. I'll also put this information in our post in our post show email as a reminder so that if you didn't get it all just now, it'll be coming to your inbox soon. So as for tonight's program, we invite you to enter questions anytime during the program through the Q&A feature you'll find along the edge of your screen. You may also vote for questions somebody else has entered if you'd also like to hear those answered. And we might not have time to answer all the questions provided, so the top vote getters will be asked first. Our speaker requests that you do not record this presentation in any fashion. Foundations recording it, and we do all of our, as we do all of our third Thursday programs, and we'll offer it on our website for your reference. 
So tonight's program is called Little, Fast and Little Fashionista on the Prairie. Our speaker is Laura Keyes, who's done extensive research on Laura Ingalls Wilder. Ms. Keyes will be telling us how the clothing of the era influenced the writings of Laura Ingalls Wilder this evening. In preparation for this presentation, she has traveled to numerous museums, including the Wilder home sites, researched countless books, and spoken with fellow Wilder and fashion historians. The presentation was created after she was twice invited to speak at the Laura Ingalls Wilder Legacy and Research Association Conference. And we're glad to have her here tonight. Laura, thank you for joining us. You are very welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, click a few buttons here uh, so that everyone can share my screen. Super. Okay. So welcome everyone. I'm very glad to have you here. Now, as Brad mentioned, I have been studying American history and social customs of the 19th century for almost 14 years. And I've been portraying women from history for that time period as well. The presentations I give are set between 1847 and 1918, encompassing ladies from every level of society. Therefore, I've had to research what ladies such as Mary Lincoln were wearing before she was setting fashion standards in the executive mansion. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was challenging women's fashions. Irene Adler, who while living in Paris in the early 1890s, saw the latest fashions as soon as they were sewed. And Laura Ingalls Wilder, who had to use her limited means and unlimited imagination to form her own wardrobe for most of her life. Now, the novels of Laura Ingalls Wilder are packed with a vivid imagery of life in the American West in the 1870s and 1880s, as well as upstate New York in the 1860s. They are complemented by illustrations by Helen Sewell, Mildred Boyle, Garth Williams, and later Renee Grafe. Although, let's face it, we are most familiar with the illustrations by Mr. Williams. Through her words, Mrs. Wilder gives us exhaustive descriptions of the everyday items and objects drawn from her memory of those times. What is more everyday and common than clothing? Well, as you can see from these lovely illustrations, these pieces of clothing are not as common anymore. And to be honest, they weren't even in everyday use during the years when Mrs. Wilder was writing the novels. I am going to help you not only understand why Mrs. Wilder wrote such detail about the clothing, but also to decipher some of the descriptive terms used, which are now considered outdated. And I will also show you many of the different layers of clothing needed to wear just one of these lovely ensembles. Now, some wonderful advice I received from an award-winning Mrs. Lincoln presenter was, when speaking of fashion and clothing, never say never or always. Seriously, we don't know when someone did or did not follow what was considered fashionable at the time. And I'll explain further as we go on. The Little House books are set from roughly 1866 to 1889. Fashion during the second half of the 19th century changed, perhaps not as quickly as it does these days, but it did change. Here, you see the basic silhouette of ladies' fashion from most of the second half of the 19th century. Keep in mind that this was the look for the height of fashion, for the women of means in large metropolitan areas. And I'm sure I don't have to remind you that those two qualifiers do not encompass the ladies of the Ingalls family. However, we have learned from Mrs. Wilder's novels that at least the fictional Ingalls ladies were very interested in fashion. 
The first dress we'll talk about today will focus on the first major description Mrs. Wilder gives to the fashions she remembered. Maz Delane. First, let's begin with the name itself. Delane is a French word meaning a fine woolen fabric. Delane is the term Mrs. Wilder uses for the dress throughout its description in Little House in the Big Woods, although when she describes it again in On the Banks of Plum Creek, she calls it a chalice, which is another term for wool cloth, more specifically printed wool cloth. Ma's beautiful Delane is described as, quote, a dark green with a little pattern all over that looked like ripe strawberries. A dressmaker had made it in the East. Laura and Mary had never seen Ma wear it, but she had shown it to them once. She had let them touch the beautiful dark red buttons that buttoned the basque up the front. And she had shown them how neatly the whale bones were put in the seams insides with hundreds of little crisscross stitches, end quote. To clarify, the basque is the part of a lady's dress which resembles a jacket with a short skirt. It could also refer to that part of the jacket that is below the waist. This style of dress with a jacket type bodice became very popular in the late 1850s uh, and on and off through the 1860s and into the 1870s. Here is an image of a vintage 1860s dress with a basque. The term whalebones is something of a misnomer. Bodices and corsets weren't stiffened with the bones from whales, but with another part of the whale called baleen. Baleen is a feathery comb-like feature in the mouths of whales screening and trapping food as they swim through the water. Baleen is made of keratin, a flexible material that's more akin to cartilage and fingernails than bones. But in the past, the definition and the whale's anatomy was blurred and baleen and whalebone were used interchangeably. Baleen was harvested by whalers and sold in strips pictured here on display in the milliner's shop in Colonial Williamsburg. If we can assume that Mrs. Wilder followed the same marital timeline for the fictional Monpa Ingalls as her parents did, then we can deduce that Ma's Delane was made circa 1858 or 1859. And in 1856, the cage crinoline was reinvented from an Italian Renaissance design. Therefore, I believe Ma's Delane was a dress made to go over a cage crinoline. And while this scene with the description took place in roughly 1873, I believe the styles of dress, the fashion of the time, had not yet traveled from the large cities in the East to the big woods of Wisconsin. Therefore, even though the dress is approximately 14 years out of date by some standards, I believe Ma would have still worn the dress over a cage crinoline for the simple reason that it is still her best dress. And since this Delane is Ma's best dress, that of course means she would wear something simpler and less costly for everyday wear. If you're still curious as to why Mrs. Wilder spent a large portion of her book describing the clothing, I'll tell you simply, it was vitally important, much more so than our clothing today. The crafting of, caring for, dressing in, and earning money to buy, clothing of all kinds was an ongoing task. While ready-made articles of clothing did exist at this time, it usually wasn't near where the Ingalls family was living. We know from reading these books that Ma, and later all the girls, sewed the clothing, the towels, the quilts, the linens, and 
any other garment for the entire family. In a later chapter, Ma chides Laura for filling her pockets so full of pretty pebbles that the pocket is torn away from the dress and rips the seam apart. While little children tearing up their clothing is nothing new, it's important to remember that every rip and tear had to be mended by hand and the garment returned to good as new status. It was the only option for the Ingalls family. I cannot compliment enough Mrs. Wilder's detailed descriptions of clothing. The images she paints with her words are lovely. And even without the assistance of illustrations, we can perfectly picture Aunt Dosha and Aunt Ruby getting ready for the dance at Grandpa's. Quote, Aunt Dosha's dress was a sprigged print, dark blue with sprigs of red flowers and green leaves thick upon it. The basque was buttoned down the front with black buttons, which looked so exactly like juicy big blackberries that Laura wanted to taste them. Aunt Ruby's dress was wine-colored calico, covered all over with a feathery pattern and a lighter wine color. It buttoned with gold-colored buttons, and every button had a little castle and a tree carved on it, end quote. You might notice that Mrs. Wilder pays particular attention to the details that would be right at the eye level of a three or four year old. Following the example of their sister-in-law, Caroline, these young ladies are also wearing their best dresses to this dance, regardless of when they were originally made. Something that isn't always mentioned in these novels, I'm sure for the sake of proprietary, propriety, are undergarments, sometimes called underpinnings or even unmentionables. Well, speaking of unmentionables, these are even more important than the dresses pictured in the illustrations. These dresses, even the everyday work dresses worn on the hottest days of summer or the longest days of the harvest, were not washed after each wearing. They were worn until it was washing day, which is Monday, according to Ma. Therefore, the underclothing was changed more often than the outerwear. Having clean and fresh underpinnings, I can tell you from experience, makes more of a difference than having the dress cleaned on a regular basis. The simple fact is that more of the skin is touching the underpinnings than it is touching the dress. Therefore, these garments are absorbing most of the oils and sweat from the skin and must be changed more often than a dress. Pictured here are a set of drawers and a chemise. Now let's take a look at all the steps it would have taken Ma, Aunt Dosha, or Aunt Ruby to prepare for that dance at Grandpa's. I'm including this in my presentation to try to give you a real sense of not only the importance of clothing in the lives of the Ingalls family, which we've already touched on, also, quite simply, time it takes to get dressed. The dress that you will see is similar to the one those ladies would have worn, though it does not have the basque front as the Delane had. The first step in putting on an ensemble like this is the chemise. This is put on over bare skin and is the first layer. The chemise is a loose garment and is typically made of cotton or linen. The next step is stockings, which may or may not be held up with garters. And drawers are put on next. These are not bloomers, these are drawers. Bloomers referred to an entire woman's costume that was popular in the early to mid 1850s, which was advertised in a magazine called The Lily by Amelia Bloomer. But back to the drawers. These drawers are bifurcated, meaning they are split and are only connected by the waistband at the top. 
Boots come next. I cannot emphasize this enough. Boots before a corset. You will only make this mistake once and then you will never make it again. Next is the corset. The corset, as you can see, fastens up the front and laces up the back. It is, it can be difficult to put on by oneself, but one gets used to it as plenty of ladies did uh, during the um, entire 19th century. It's completely possible to put it on by oneself. The corset that I have is linen and therefore it breathes very well, which is what you want in a corset. There are ties at the top, um, as you can just see there, and uh, ties in the middle front. Those are the long laces that are pulled very tight. And um, as you will see in uh, the next photo there, and then they do loop around and tie in the front. The next step is a modesty petticoat. And just like it sounds, it is for modesty. Um, this petticoat is pretty close to the legs and it comes down to completely cover the ankles. One wants that, especially one when one would be going to a dance at grandpa's because if uh, a woman were to be swung around quickly and her skirt might fly up uh, during a dance, this modesty petticoat would still cover her ankles so that her ankles would not show even when dancing joyously. The, you can see there the close-up of the decoration on the modesty petticoat. And um, if anyone is curious how, uh, how decorated, how fancy would a woman's underpinnings be? The answer is the same as if you would ask a woman today as fancy as she wants them to be or as fancy as her budget will allow. The next step is the cage crinoline. Um, as you can see, it looks just like a cage. Um, it is a spherical design and it fastens uh, in the front with two very wicked looking teeth that have actually drawn blood. The next step is the under petticoat. Um, this is typically not decorated much at all. And after that is the top petticoat. Um, I chose to have the decoration on the top petticoat match the drawers and the modesty petticoat, and that was my own personal decision. This would have a bit more decoration. The next step is the camisole. This is also called a corset cover. And again, the, the ribbon and the decoration uh, was chosen to match. Next step is the skirt. This dress comes as a separate bodice and skirt. This was really a personal preference because it's completely possible after the skirt and then the bodice was uh, sewn uh, individually, they could be stitched together pretty much just for the ease of putting it on. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, with this ensemble, the skirt is next and the bodice comes after that. Um, this bodice does fasten down the front, um, which was very typical at, at this time in the late 1850s um, to uh, early to mid 1860s. Um, this bodice fastens with hooks and eyes down the front. And as you can see, if you look clear, carefully, the buttons, the brass buttons that are used are ornamental. Um, this is a very clever way of making your cloth last longer. If you think about it, if you don't use the buttons for their intended purpose, that means you're not cutting the other side of the bodice into buttonholes. You are not cutting that other side at all. It is, it remains whole. If this bodice would, were to be remade, perhaps the, uh, the owner of this bodice were to gain a lot of weight or lose a lot of weight, and therefore it would have to be refitted, then you're not worried about any slashes to the fabric as you would have to have with uh, buttonholes. Simply the uh, hooks and eyes would be moved and you're not ruining any fabric. Next step is to fasten the bodice to the skirt um, with uh, hooks and bars there. 
Um, hoax and bars uh, perhaps were not typically used. Um, what is typically seen is a, uh, a actually a buttonhole and a button um, there from uh, to connect the bodice to the skirt. The modern reproduction, the modern usage is to use a hook and bar. The collar um, would usually be already put onto the bodice um, and it would be put onto the bodice before the uh, bodice would be worn. A collar may be removed, which uh, of course helps because then one could bleach and starch and uh, press the collar separately from the bodice. Um, but of course that would be uh, stitched back on before the bodice was, was put onto the human. Um, I choose to leave the uh, collar pin that you see there uh, on the bodice. Um, that collar pin does actually date from the 1860s. So when I do wear this ensemble, I'm very happy to wear uh, authentic um, jewelry, though it's, uh, it's very difficult to um, keep them on sometimes. So I, I don't take on and off the jewelry often. I just keep it on. So put all together, this is what Maz Delane might have looked like even 14 years after it was made. And that was not just an idea of what it took to get dressed for a fancy event or what constituted a fancy event in the backwoods of Wisconsin. The character Laura Ingalls' attitude towards clothing and fashion changes as she grows up, as can be said of so many other young ladies throughout time. In the books, Little House on the Prairie, On the Banks of Plum Creek, and even in By the Shores of Silver Lake, Mrs. Wilder describes the washing, ironing, mending, and creation of clothing for the family, but doesn't show that Laura Ingalls is at all interested in the fashions of the day until she starts to become a young lady. And by the time we reach those books, a whole new silhouette has come in. So let's look back on that silhouette chart you saw earlier and see how fashion has progressed. Now I'm going to focus on the dresses Mrs. Wilder describes in the fictional Ingalls family creating and wearing in Little Town on the Prairie and These Happy Golden Years. One of the first dresses Mrs. Wilder describes in such detail is actually Mary. Now, if we are to assume that the timeline for the fictional Ingalls family follows that of the real Ingalls family, this scene would have been set in the summer of 1881. According to the text, Ma and Laura were worried because while they were buying the dress goods, Mrs. White had told them that she had heard from her sister in Iowa that hoop skirts were coming back in New York. Mrs. Wilder might have included that this exchange to add an element of tension in an otherwise mundane chore, or Mrs. Wilder's sister might have been about two years ahead of the game. Because wearing hoops was not mentioned in any issue of Godey's Ladies Book from May through September of 1881. And yes, I did look at every issue that year. Let's pause for a moment to talk about hoops. The term hoops is a very generic term that used to describe any piece of underclothing made from a type of spring steel or wire. When any hoops are worn, they alter the shape of the skirt, holding it away from the body. Hoops do not always mean the cage crinoline, which you saw earlier, here is a different set of hoops worn later in the 1860s to give an elliptical shape to the skirt. Some sources I've encountered date the use of these terms only up to 1869, at which point the cage crinoline went out of style and eventually the bustle came into style. However, look at this ad from 1874, which uses the term skirt very generally. Here is a prime example of why I use my favorite piece of advice when speaking of fashion and clothing, 
never say never. The hoops that Mrs. Wilder describes, specifically in this example of creating Mary's dress, most likely look something like this. As you can see, this wire frame would have lifted the back and sides of the skirt a number of inches away from the legs, thus achieving the silhouette that was preferred in the late 1870s. Now let's return to poor Mary, who has been patiently modeling the cashmere dress. Quote, the gourd skirt of brown cashmere was smooth and rather tight in front, but gathered full around the sides and back so that it would be ample for hoops. In front, it touched the floor evenly. In back, it swept into a graceful short train. The overskirt was of the brown and blue plaid. It was shirred in front. It was draped up at the sides to show more of the skirt beneath. And at the back, it fell into full rich puffs, caught up above the flounced train. I believe this dress more closely resembles the look that was popular the previous year, which is understandable. Here is an article from Godey's Ladies Book published November 1880, giving a pattern and detailed instructions on how to create this trained skirt. I can just imagine this magazine coming to Ma perhaps via their friend, Mrs. Boast, after the long winter. Also, shirring is a method of puffing fabric. To shirr fabric is to draw up running stitches in several parallel rows. The very top ribbon in lilac has been shirred. As I mentioned earlier, at this time in her life, the fictional Miss Ingalls is indeed noticing the clothing and fashions of not just her family, but of those around her as well. Quote, Mary Power's clothes were so beautifully fitted because her father tailored them and she did her hair in the stylish new way with bangs, end quote. Miss Eliza Jane Wilder, on the first day of teaching her only school term in Dismit, described as wearing a, quote, dark gray dress stylishly made like Mary's best one, tight and straight in the front with a pleated ruffle just touching the floor and an overskirt draped and puffed above a little train, end quote. Laura Ingalls is also jealous of Nellie Olson's school dresses. When Laura is described as wearing her best sprigged calico dress, and Nellie wears, quote, a fawn color dress made with polonaise. Deep pleated ruffles were around the bottom of the skirt, around her back, and falling from the edges of the wide sleeves, and her throat was a full jabot of lace, end quote. To clarify, a polonaise is a long overbodice, about knee length, Fit it to the body without a waist seam and worn over a long skirt. A jabot is an ornamental frill or ruffle on the front of a shirt or blouse, typically made of lace. And in my opinion, Mr. Williams did an excellent job illustrating Nellie and all her haughtiness. Not only did Mr. Williams capture Nellie Olson's attitude, he also succeeded in showing off how stylish her clothing was, something that Laura Ingalls admits her jealousy of later in the book. This photograph, dated circa 1880, shows another young lady wearing that fashionable polonaise. According to the fictional timeline, a few months later, Mrs. Wilder describes Laura's best winter dress. It was brown woolen made in princess style. The collar was a high, tight band close under Laura's chin, and the skirt came down to the tops of her high button shoes with piping of red around wrists and collar, and the buttons all down the front were of brown horn. About two sentences describing Laura's best winter dress versus about five pages describing Mary's. It's not hard to see that 
even decades later, Mrs. Wilder wasn't happy with the dresses Laura had when comparing them to others. The princess style of the dress was actually a relatively fashionable one. It had been first introduced in 1848, but wasn't very fashionable until the 1860s, when it was occasionally called the Gabrielle cut. We see Mary Lincoln modeling the style of dress here. The princess style saw a resurgence in the late 1870s and the early 1880s. There is some debate over which European princess the style is named for, but the dress was constructed with shoulder to hem seams and no waist seams. Some of you might be puzzling that out. So let me try to explain it another way. The vast majority of ladies dresses consisted of a few large pieces of fabric for the skirt, then medium to small sized pieces for the bodice and the sides, etc. This princess style dress is just a few long pieces connected together at the shoulder and then hemmed, and then two small tubes for the sleeves. This princess style of dress requires an enormous amount of confidence on the part of the seamstress, for there are no places to just gather the tucks together and hide your mistakes. That isn't an option in the princess style. Here is an image from Godey's Ladies Book, December 1880. As you can see, the dress consists of a few large pieces, which had to be expertly cut and sewn together in order to create the smooth line of this gown, though decoration has been added to this image. Both Mrs. Wilder and the fictional Laura Ingalls were happier with Laura's next winter best dress. Quote, it was a young lady's dress of blue cashmere, so long that it hid the high tops of her button shoes. The full gathered skirt was gathered as full in the back as it could possibly be. Over it fitted the tight basque that came down in points in front and in back and buttoned snugly with little green buttons straight up the front. A band of blue and gold and green plaid went around the skirt just above the hem and narrow strips of plaid edged the pointed bottom of the basque and went around the wrists of the tight, long sleeves. The upstanding collar was of plaid with a frill of white lace inside it." End quote. It is obvious that this dress, the first design for a young lady, pleased Laura Ingalls. I'd like to spend a little time on the details. This Upstanding collar is a common style at the time. And some of you may, might have noticed that this isn't the first dress that is described as having a complementary fabric used as a decorative feature near the hem rather than machine made ribbon or lace. Quite frankly, this is a cheaper way to dress up a dress. She made lace at this time was still expensive, though it was slowly dropping in price thanks to the ongoing Industrial Revolution. Homemade lace, which we know the Ingalls family made, is time consuming, and therefore it was a more cost effective method of dressmaking to trim the hems in a complementary fabric rather than lots of lace or even machine made ribbon. By the start of the next school year, the fictional Laura is 15 years old. According to Little Town on the Prairie, hoops have finally come in and Ma bought a set for Laura. She let down the hem of the brown dress and made it over so cleverly that it could be worn over hoops perfectly well and the full blue cashmere needed no changing, end quote. As I mentioned earlier, with just the most basic description in her novels, I've come to the conclusion that the hoops to which Mrs. Wilder refers in this instance are close to this style. Part of that reason is because about two years later in what is probably summer 1883, Laura Ingalls 
as a new set of hoops. In these happy golden years, Mrs. Wilder takes considerable time describing these, quote, they were the very latest style in the East, and these were the first of the kind that Miss Bell had. It was an adjustable bustle, end quote. The dress that goes along with this description, the brown poplin, is clearly Laura's new Sunday best. I'm sorry to tell you that the only accompanying illustration in this scene is here, showing just a small part of Miss Ingalls' bonnet and nothing of this lovely dress. Quote, over all the starched petticoats, Laura put on the underskirt of her new dress. It was a brown cambric fitting smoothly around the top over the bustle and gore to flare smoothly down over the hoops. At the bottom, just missing the floor, was a 12-inch wide flounce of the brown poplin bound with an inch wide band of plain brown silk. Then, over this underskirt and her starched white corset cover, Laura put on the polonaise. Its smooth, long sleeves fitted her arms perfectly to the wrist. The neck was high, with a smooth band of the plain silk around the throat. The polonaise fitted tightly and buttoned all down the front. Below the smooth hips, it flared and rippled down and covered the top of the flounce on the underskirt. To give you a sense of how much is happening in one dress, here is a similar ensemble I occasionally wear when portraying Laura Ingalls Wilder. As you can see, the overskirt add mu adds much to the plain underskirt and the bodice or polonaise is trimmed with complementary fabric. If anyone is curious, poplin is a type of fabric made from silk and worsted wool, which came in a variety of different styles and weavings. And cambric is technically a fine white fabric made of flax or linen, and it could refer to a fabric made to imitate true linen. And the imitation could be of any color. This entire description, particularly the mention of the hoops, shows that young Miss Ingalls is not only very interested in fashion, but the post-delivery has caught up with the times, and she is able to obtain the latest fashions practically at the same time as her counterparts back east. Here is a print from Godey's Ladies Book from March 1883. The last dress I'd like to examine in Mrs. Wilder's novel is the summer dress described the next summer as Laura's new lawn. Quote, a delicate pink lawn with small flowers and pale green leaves scattered all over it, end quote. As you can deduce from the description, lawn is a type of fabric that was often, but not always, made from linen and was very light or fine. According to Mrs. Wilder's description, Laura and Ma, quote, made the waist tight fitting with two clusters of tucks down the back and two in front. Down the center of the front, between the tucks, white pearl buttons buttoned the waist. The collar was a straight, upstanding fold of the lawn. The sleeves were long, gathered at the shoulders, and close fitting to the waist. Beneath the bottom tuck of the skirt was a full gathered ruffle four inches wide that just touched Laura's shoe tips. End quote. Some of you might have noticed that throughout the description of Miss Ingalls' dresses made during her teen years, there seems to be one constant, a simple upstanding collar as opposed to a common folded white one. The accompanying illustrations also show that detail, most likely because the real Laura Ingalls Wilder favored that look as we know from the few photographs of her taken at this point in her life. Now this is the true definition of style as opposed to fashion. Yes, we just saw that according to Godey's Ladies Book, that upstanding collar was fashionable at the time, 
But the fact that Miss Ingalls continues to create her dresses with that collar for years before and years after Godey's declares it to be fashionable means that this was Miss Ingalls' style and she liked it regardless of when it was in fashion. Now, back to Laura's new lawn dress. The description given in the book focused so much on the cloth and the construction that I actually started second guessing myself that the young Miss Ingalls was still wearing a dress with the new hoops. However, a few chapters later, my fears were laid to rest and my funny bone was tickled. On this very hot summer Sunday, Ma, Carrie, and Grace had stayed home from church and only Mary and Laura accompanied Pa. Quote, Laura saw a small plump kitten straying up the aisle. Then at her side in the aisle, a small dog passed. The kitten's back rose in an arch, its tail swelled, and in a flash it vanished from Laura's view. Laura barely had time to wonder when she felt a slight swing of her hoops. And looking down, she saw the tip of the kitten's tail slide out of sight beneath the pale lawn ruffle. The kitten had taken refuge under her hoops and now it began climbing up inside of them, clutching and clawing its way from wire to wire. End quote. While some of you may find this anecdote absurd, I will soon show you that it is indeed possible and even probable that a curious little kitten could make her way up to a bustle. It is time for another demonstration of the steps it would take for Miss Ingalls to dress appropriately. You will remember that the first few steps are to don the chemise, stockings, boots or shoes, drawers, and the corset. And I hope you'll remember that the next step is the modesty petticoat, as you see me putting on right now. As I said, even with uh, a cage crinoline or hoop skirt or any sort of hoops, if the wind were to catch them, if one were to be stepping up or stepping down from a wagon, one still did not want one's ankles shown. So that is why a modesty petticoat was still very helpful. The next step is the bustle. And as I showed you earlier, I really do believe that this was the style of bustle that uh, Miss Ingalls would have worn. Um, her bustle uh, described in the novels was an adjustable bustle with more tapes. Uh, she used the word tapes um, often. And so the pattern that I found had a little bit of adjustment, um, but actually uh, I chose to make it with um, complete cloth over in the front rather than a series of tapes, as you might've seen earlier with the cage crinoline. It gives a more smooth shape um, to, the, uh, to the skirt, as you will see. The next step here is um, uh, one petticoat. I chose to wear just one petticoat uh, for this demonstration, just kind of to move it along. But in all honesty, um, probably two or three petticoats would have been made. And you see me here with every layer, taking the time uh, to make sure that it lays just right, that um, no, nothing is bunched, so that the next layer on top of that will lay smoothly and nothing is bunched up. So that is why after every layer, taking the time to make sure that it lays just right. The corset cover is next. And as you saw from the uh, previous um, photographs, you saw that the corset cover goes on uh, over the corset and creates a smooth line. This is what uh, was wanted in the silhouette. No matter what changed in the skirt, Actually, the top of the body, um, the bodice, that always stayed a uh, very, um, it, or I should say it didn't change much um, over the course of a number of decades, a very tight and a very smooth line to the upper part of the body um, and therefore the bodice. And you can see with this corset cover, I've 
actually the buttons that I used to, um, to button it up, a, a placket of um, fabric, a piece of fabric actually covers the buttons to even offer a smooth look to that because um, that is what is wanted, a very tight, very smooth look for the bodice. The skirt is next. The skirt, of course, is made to go um, over the, the bodice and uh, wanting it to, to sit just right um, there. And um, you'll see me sometimes with um, uh, fastening things at my waist, sometimes in the front uh, of the body, sometimes over to the side of the body. And that um, is, is uh, actually very helpful so that you don't have um, petticoat upon petticoat upon petticoat, just uh, the, the fasteners of that just kind of layering up and up and up. You actually want the fasteners to, to be on different sides of your waist. The next step is the bodice and um, putting this on um, is a little bit tricky again, because it's meant to be a very tight fit, um, very tight indeed. Uh, the sleeves are tight, the shoulders are tight and buttoning up, um, it is tight not only because that's the fit, but as you will see, I'm actually taking extra care to fasten it because the buttons that I chose to use for this ensemble are actually uh, actual vintage buttons that date to about, um, they date to about the, the 19 teens. They don't quite date to the 1880s, but they are vintage buttons nonetheless. And so when I um, am putting this on, I'm being extra careful not to add any stress on the buttons and therefore putting the stress on the fabric. So if there's a tiny tear in the fabric, I can mend that, it's fine, but not on the buttons. And uh, for those of you who remember the description, Mrs. Wilder described um, uh, them as pearl buttons. Now it is true that actual pearls, complete spherical pearls, um, could be bored to use as buttons. However, those would have been more expensive. And so what you see here are mother of pearl. These are buttons taken from these shells that then created um, pearls. So it's, uh, it's something that we'll never truly know what exactly buttons she used, but this is the conclusion that I came to based on um, what I know of the Ingalls finances based on what was available to her at the time. So as you can see, I am putting the last, the finishing touch on there, the hat, which um, has three ostrich feathers, just as uh, described in the book. I'm done with my ensemble. Here we have the finished dress, showing just how large this style of bustle is. And for those of you who are curious, yes, it is possible to have an adventurous little kitten crawl up your bustle while you are sitting down. So thank you for attending this lecture. This has been Little Fashionista on the Prairie. Now I would be happy to answer any questions that you have about uh, the fashion that Mrs. Wilder put into her books. That's great. Thank you, Laura. There are uh, several questions here, and you know, I'm going to ask one that I think everybody's thinking of, but nobody dared type. And that is, after you get all those layers on, and you're at the party, and you might have a cup of cider and another cup of cider and a few more, uh, how difficult is it going to be to go out and use the outhouse? It's actually a lot easier than these days. If you remember the description that I gave you of the drawers, they were bifurcated, meaning they are split. The two tubes of fabric are connected to the waistband and they are split. Okay. That's... So there is nothing to take down and then bring back up. Okay. I guess they figured out the solutions for all those. Yes. Um, another person is asking about, and I was wondering this also, how are these outer garments cleaned if you spill something on them or mud made lands on the lower portions? You know, uh, 
some of those looked like they were very flowing and, and would drag across the floor and and the streets those days were probably dirt at best and hopefully not full of mud and rain on a bad day. But um, I could see those dresses getting very dirty and made out of wool. How are you going to get those kind of things clean? A couple different um, answers. Um, the first answer is that uh, a, a regular dress, an everyday average house dress, a work dress, um, if we can use that term, so perhaps not what I've taken the time to describe today. Those dresses um, would have been made from regular old cotton, drop them in the boiling laundry and they're fine. Um, so that's, that's those clothing. Um, this nicer clothing that I'm describing, not only that Ma had with her Delane, but of course what Alvora had as a young lady, it's uh, possible that those would have been um, you would have preferred to spot clean them. However, um, they had to have been clean, they had to have been able to be cleaned on some level. And so um, as, as I described, um, the poplin uh, was a fabric made from um, a combination of silk and worsted wool. They were woven together in different weaves. So that it would have had to have been able to be washed. Um, and, and so perhaps just carefully. Um, and so of course one would not uh, use uh, the starch, I'm sorry, use the bleach in, in a, in a um, dress like that, but um, answers carefully, um, but they, they had have been washed. However, I will very uh, quickly speak to um, what else uh, Brad uh, brought up as well. Um, the, the fact that um, the, the fashion started to have these trains of, uh, on, on the skirts, the, the skirts were actually you know, dragging on at the very least across the floor, if not the, uh, the dirty street. One thing that was done that I, I, I didn't have time to really touch on is that for those dresses that have um, these trains that would drag on the floor, there would be extra special petticoats that would also drag on the floor. And so either the petticoats would be underneath the skirt and therefore the petticoats would be actually the ones dragging on the floor or the ground. Or what I have also seen on um, authentic pieces is that underneath the train, if you were to flip that train over, that actually has a lot of um, pieces of fabric. It's a very thick piece of the ensemble so that that underside, um, like a thick lining, that lining could be could could absorb all of this dirt, and that could be either taken off and just replaced, or taken off and um, and uh, laundered. So uh, the train itself would have had a very thick lining. Okay, and as, as tight as some of those things are, you know, with the corsets and all that, what did the pregnant women wear, and how did they handle that? Yeah. So um, there were such a thing as um, pregnant stays. Um, they're called by a couple different names, but it's pretty much um, pregnant stays, pregnant corset, um, because we have to remember that the corset was the main foundation garment. It's what women used to, um, to just keep everything in place. Um, nowadays, the style is to have um, the garment that goes over the shoulders and that helps keep everything in place. But the corset was what uh, the foundation garment was and that kept everything in place. And so women needed to keep things in place um, even while they were pregnant. And so, um, and so that uh, 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 what was usually called pregnancy stays were still worn at that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, quite a few votes on, on this question from Katie and it's, it's, would the stockings always be held up by garters or were there other methods to help them stay on? Um, typically garters, um, it was, especially because stockings, um, we know with the Ingalls family and very typical of other families, they would have been homemade. They would not have been purchased elsewhere. Um, so uh, the stockings could possibly have been made in such a way that um, they uh, hugged the shape of the calf and therefore stayed up on its own because um, it, it was just made in such a way it was it was made tight at the top. 
that could have been an option. Um, elastic to the top of a stocking um, really did not come into a uh, place in, uh, in frequent use in fashion, honestly, until kind of like the late 1950s. Um, and it, it existed. I mean, things like that did exist, but they were not put into the fashion until the late 1950s. And so um, if anyone wants to look up some old 1930s movies, you will see men wearing garters yeah. of their socks because men had to keep their socks up as well. And you'll mm -hmm. see that into the if you if you look for some of those uh, movies made in the 1930s and uh, 1940s. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Deb is asking, and, and I want to tie in some other questions that go along with this. What, what was the cost of hoops? And then where did they get you talked a little bit about, you know, you can't just order stuff off the shelf or sometimes they're, mm -hmm. that's available, but, you know, so where do they get their fabrics from? And, you know, they, is everybody sewing their own style and sewing their own clothes to make these, these things happen? And, and where do they get it? Do they have to order it? Do they have to wait for months for it to come in? And, you know, how does all that come about? Well, Talking specifically about the Ingalls family, and um, the the answer to that is uh, through the mail. They get these things through the mail. They get the hoops through the mail. Um, you saw a little bit with the Godie's Ladies book that that book not only gives you um, the patterns right there in in the in the book, which is what it was called the the book, but it was it was just a very very thick magazine. Um, and so the magazine itself would give you these patterns that you had to then trace, you know, take your own personal measurements and trace, um, uh, usually using newspaper or some other large uh, piece of paper that you had in, in the home. So that's where you got your patterns. And as to where you got your hoops, sometimes patterns existed for hoops in those magazines. Other times, as was described twice in um, Little House on the Prairie, I'm sorry, Little Town on the Prairie, and um, these happy golden years, uh, the Ingalls family uh, purchased the hoops through the mail. And um, Sears and Roebuck was very popular. There were a couple other um, uh, uh, mail order places as well. And at least described in the book, and remember these books are fiction, but they're based on fact. Um, what was described in the book is that the milliner, Miss Bell, was able to obtain a set of hoops. And so as a milliner, as a business owner, she quite possibly had some sources that the average person did not. So mm -hmm. that's part of the answer to the question. And the other answer to the question of where did they get the fabrics? There's little evidence that fabrics were purchased outside of the stores that existed in DeSmit at the time. Um, I don't believe I've read in, in any of um, Mrs. Wilder's uh, memoirs or anything like that. She doesn't say that the family traveled to another large town to do their shopping. Um, the family did their shopping in DeSmit. And therefore, whatever stores, and as we know, over the years, there is a variety of general stores, dry goods stores, et cetera, um, they used what fabric was there. Um, the Sears Robot catalog did offer um, bolts of fabric uh, for sale, but they were usually by the bolt, and, um, and therefore you had to commit to buy the entire bolt of fabric, and not everyone wanted to do that. So along with like the cost of a, of a hoop, um, was, that, oh, was that a big expense for somebody? Was that like a status um, symbol to be able to afford? It was a uh, little bit of a status symbol, um, only because if you really think about it, it wasn't a necessity. It was not at all a necessity. You could argue that clothing is a necessity, but you didn't need a hoop. You didn't need one. It was, it was, a, it, it was not a necessity. Mm -hmm. So um, while I do not have an exact price for you, unfortunately, um, I can say it, it was probably seen as a little bit of a status symbol. And um, looking at it from a fictional point of view, just looking at the, at the novels that Mrs. Wilder wrote, it's obvious that 
young Miss Ingalls is so excited. He keeps asking her, especially her mother, for this. And, and she's so excited when she gets that. I mean, think, think back when you were a, a teenager. I'm sure there was something that you kept asking for. And then you were so excited when your parents finally agreed, yes, you may get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and it was, it would be, I, I could see how the price would be relative to, you know, the, the difficulty of achieving that kind of mm -hmm. thing. So it's, it's probably right along those lines. Um, they also would like to know, how do you sit down in a hoop skirt? You know, you've got all that space around you to manage. And, and I've seen some people try and sit down in those and they just woof, come right up over their face. Uh, then, I imagine there's a trick to it. Yes. I mean, the folks that that happens to them, they, they just they they don't know how to do it. <laughs> Um, as I mentioned before, the uh, in in those hoops, the the bustle that you saw me wear, and in the cage crinoline, those are made from spring steel. It flexes. It 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 actually is. I, I am able to um, twist them so that they just smush up in in like about that thick of an area. That's that's not anyway. It's just they can be moved. They can be, um, and so the the trick is to just smush them and just sit down. But um, do your best to sit down in a chair without arms. It is very <laughs> difficult. I will admit to that. It is difficult to sit in a bustle or hoop skirt in a chair with arms. Okay. And um, picture that. Yeah. Um, occasionally in my life um, as my, and, you know, wearing my other hat as, as a librarian and when folks find out what, what I do and I wear these different um, costumes, I'm, I'm every year I'm asked, oh, are you going to wear that costume for Halloween? Is that what you're going to dress up as this Halloween? And I said, how do you think I can sit in my office chair and do my job? I can't do that <laughs> at all. Sure. So, so the answer is no, I don't, I don't wear these for Halloween at work because I, I can't sit in my office chair and do, do a job right. in a hoop skirt in front of my computer, mm -hmm. not all day. Right. Well, uh, our last question for tonight is, uh, are all these layers of clothing, you know, would they certainly uh, reinforce appropriate behavior on the part of the young male companion? So um, it's not like it's, uh, well, I'm not going to go there, but uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So That's what, another what conversation. That? <laughs> <laughs> um, pretty much it, it actually uh, reinforces more things to the female mind than the male mind. Um, but having women in these, uh, in this type of clothing um, with uh, the corset with uh, at first many layers of petticoats and then eventually uh, a cage crinoline or bustle of some kind um, that reinforces uh, a, a lot of things, um, both consciously and unconsciously. It makes it difficult for them to um, makes it difficult for them to move around um, in certain circumstances. It makes it difficult to to do any type of um, uh, manual labor in those types of clothing. Like of, of course, the Ingalls family had uh, the the women of the family were doing plenty of work, including laundry. Laundry is extremely uh, labor intensive, extremely. And they were doing it. However, they were not doing it in a cage crinoline or a bustle. Um, and so what I'm getting at is uh, wearing that type of clothing, um, put the conscious or unconscious um, uh, uh, ideas in, in women's minds that all that they can do is kind of sit and do nothing. And that went on for, you know, centuries. And, um, and I, I just briefly touched on, it was Amelia Bloomer, her friend, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her friend, Susan B. Anthony, who actually started uh, suggesting that women should wear something else and women should do something else and women should be able to do more. And so learning more about fashion um, helps you understand so much more of uh, whatever bit of history you're looking into, whether it's the life of Laura Ingalls Wilder, which is a fascinating bit of history, or any other bit of history. Learning more about the fashion will tell you more about the history. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I sure appreciate your time and all uh, for doing that. And I, I can tell you that 
uh, I'm glad that the only struggle I have is to get this tied. You know, <laughs> and that's the worst thing I have to worry about than, than uh, 300 buttons and, and all those <laughs> tight fitting things. So, uh, you know, I guess it makes me appreciate uh, this a little bit more than, than, uh, than before when I yeah, thought it was such a pain, but uh, seeing that all those things that they had to go through then. Um, but that is all the time we have for questions for now. And I do want to thank you for, uh, Laura, for joining us tonight for an excellent presentation. I'd also like to thank the Herbert Hoover Library Museum and the National Historic Site, and then all of the public libraries who helped make tonight's program a success. You know, I encourage you all to come visit the Hoover campus and walk around, enjoy the park, explore the historic buildings as the temperatures begin to cool. The leaves are going to begin to change soon in the coming weeks, and, it, and it's quite a, a beautiful walk and place to enjoy some quiet time. Uh, for now, the library remains closed to the public, but their staff is working behind the scenes as we wait for the local COVID numbers to drop. The National Historic Site and the historic buildings and the visitor center are open for you to enjoy and to explore. And don't forget to join us next uh, month, October 21st at 6 p.m. for another interesting program. So uh, the Hoover Presidential Foundation, uh, the staff, uh, we're ready to assist you with your membership needs and your charitable gifts and support of the Hoover campus and the museum renovation. You can learn more about that. Um, you can show your support at Timeless Values Campaign Dot org. And on behalf of all of us here at the Hoover campus and the participating public libraries, we thank you for joining us tonight and we look forward to your next visit to the Hoover campus.